I don't get it. Sometimes I don't understand. How did this season get so busy? How did my life get so distracted and chaotic? This is a time that should be a time of rest, of, of reflection, a time of restoration, a time of peace. But it's, it's the busiest time of the year, the most hectic, the most chaotic, the most pressure-filled, with the highest expectations. How did that happen? It wasn't that way when I was growing up. When I was growing up, Christmas was fun. Christmas was a blast. Christmas was awesome. Christmas was no pressure at all. Now I realized I was just a kid, and you know the adults did all the heavy lifting, and they paid for the train set. I just got it. I didn't know where the money came from, never worried about it or what was going on. I was, I was just enjoying the season. Life was simple. It was simple. It was, it was a, a time of celebration. I mean, everything about it was simple. Even, even the gifts were simple. The toys were simple. Did any of you ever get one of these, an Etch-a-Sketch, when you were a kid growing up? Yeah, yeah, world's favorite drawing toy. What world is this the favorite drawing toy of? This is one of the most frustrating toys you can ever give to a child. It says, it says it will give a child hours of fun. Yeah, if they're in prison. <laughs> you ever try and draw a face or a circle or anything other than like rectangular lines that go nowhere with this thing? It's totally frustrating, but it's really simple. All it does, is that doesn't do a bunch of other stuff doesn't read you stories it's like board games board games were part of christmas and this was before board games were you know complicated by different worlds and lives and they had rule books the size of the bible and 18-sided dice that you had to throw and it, these were simple games like Parcheesi and, and, uh, and Chutes and Ladders and Candyland and Sorry. And, and one of our favorite games that we played every Christmas was Monopoly. You ever play Monopoly at Christmas? We played Monopoly because we had one objective. It was to bankrupt my mother. <laughs> I know that sounds rude, but she was so gullible. It was like, Mom, yeah, you don't want Park Place and Boardwalk. Boring. Or you don't want those railroads, dirty old railroads. You don't want those. And she was always the one who would get busted first and run out of money. Sorry, Mom, you're broke because you landed on my nine hotels. But we, I don't think we ever finished a game of Monopoly, ever. We just kind of got bored with hating each other the whole time. My favorite board game was a real simple game. It had one objective. It was spend all your money. It was called Go for Broke. It is the life story of some of you. And I'm apparently very gifted at it. I'm much better at spending it than collecting it. So this was, this was my favorite game, but it was so simple. It was so uncomplicated. And I think that's always the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it was at first. The Christmas story is a simple story. It's, it's a story of God stripping down. It's a story of God eliminating from, from his presence the, the majesty and the glory and becoming like us. It's, it's like God simplifying himself and saying, I want you to be with me and I want to be with you. It's a, it's a simple story of two young kids on the adventure of their lives, following this mission to, to give birth to the, the savior of the world. And they find themselves in the hours of labor and delivery without a place to stay. They were stripped of everything. They didn't, they, they didn't give birth in a hospital or in a palace or even a, a nice hotel. They were outside in a barn. And all they had was each other. And it was enough. It was enough that they were there with their son, that they were there with the promised child. Their presence was enough. Now, I know the Christmas story has some fantastic features. There's the part about the angelic visitors and how they filled the heavens. That's not something you see every day. That's something you run home and tell your friends about. You don't forget that. But if you think about the angelic visitors, they, they didn't show up in, in downtown Jerusalem. They didn't show up in cities around the globe. It could have been a celestial phenomenon that everyone on earth saw. But the only people who saw it were a handful of shepherds. And shepherds weren't even middle class. Shepherds were outcasts. They were the misfits. They were the marginalized ones. And the angels put on a full display for them and then disappeared. 
And there's the story of the kings from the east, the magi, the wise men who traveled from eastern lands. We don't know what the lands were. We don't know anything about, about, about who they are or how big their entourage was. We know they didn't show up with a great army. We know they didn't give out commemorative t-shirts or hand out pamphlets. There were no press conferences. We know that when they got to the place where they found the child they were looking for, that they opened their treasure chests and they worshiped him and they gave him three simple gifts. Gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And gold may be appealing to us, but these are essential oils and perfumes and gold. And, and we're forced to read between the lines of the Christmas story if we want to find the complicated part. Because what it does is it strips everything down to what matters most. And what mattered most on that day was not the presence that the wise men gave. It was their presence there. It was just that they were there at all, and that was enough. It was more than enough. I think we all know, I think we all know that, that people are more important than things, don't we? We're not barbarians. We understand that relationships matter, that the people that matter to us, who we matter to, are, are the most precious thing. They're more precious than the stuff. But what if, what if we said, my gift this Christmas to the people I care about, the thing I, I'm looking for and the thing I want to give is to be fully present, to be fully present with them, because that's enough. That's good enough. That's more than just good enough. That's more than enough. To just be present with one another, with people who care about you and people you care about. Maybe we, maybe we're just trying too hard. Maybe we're, maybe we're just so busy because because we're trying to make everything perfect for everybody. We're trying to arrange schedules and we're trying to host parties and we're trying to make sure that everybody gets along. We're trying to manage everything and we're, and we're so busy that we can't be present. As I was reflecting on this, I realized I don't think I ever saw my mother sit down at Christmas. There was always something in the oven or something on the stove, or something she had to go do. She was always getting up, always moving around, always busy because she wanted everyone to have the perfect experience. She wanted everyone to get along. She was so busy hosting that she wasn't really present. And I can tell you I would rather have her than a hundred of her pies. Maybe, maybe we struggle to be fully present because we've forgotten how. It's understandable. We live in a culture that, that is constantly interrupting us, that is constantly distracting us, and maybe we've forgotten that our phone has an off button. You can turn it off. It is possible to sit in a room without the TV on. And I know there's football on, and you're saying, well, I'm good at multitasking. I can watch the game, and I can text my friend, and I can check my emails, and have an in-depth conversation with my friends. <laughs> Do you know what it is to listen anymore? Do you even know? When was the last time you had a conversation where you looked at the person who was talking to you, and you looked into their eyes, and you listened? without thinking of what you were going to say when they were done talking. I think we've forgotten how to be fully present. Or maybe, maybe, our busyness is our brokenness. Maybe our busyness is, is a reflection of our insecurity, of, of our fear. We don't feel we have value just being there. We have to do something, we have to contribute, we have to add significance. And so, so our brokenness and our insecurity and our fear and our anxiety compels us to be busy. We don't know how to stop because we don't think it's good enough. We don't think we're good enough. We don't think it's valuable enough for us just to be fully present. But I can tell you, you are good enough. And that there are people for whom the greatest gift you can give them is your presence. And you don't have to take my word for it within arm's length of all of us in this room are people who know that to be true because of the gaping absence hole that is in their heart. 
There are people in this room who know all too well that they would trade every Christmas present they ever had for one more Christmas presents with someone they've lost. We know this is true. We know it's true. So what if this year we decide to be fully present, that the greatest gift we give is the simplest one of our presence, and that we appreciate and cherish the presence of those we care about, who care about us in our life. This was, this was, this was the essence of the Christmas story a simple expression of God's presence. He said, you will call his name Emmanuel. It means God with us. It means God is present with us. He is with us and we are with him. His greatest gift. It can't get much more simple than that. Totally stripped down to being together. That's what Christmas was. I think that's what made it so uncomplicated for me. I knew what was most important as a child. The gifts were great and the presents were wonderful and even the crocheted socks that my grandmother made me were okay. But just being together was really what mattered with my aunts and my uncles and my cousins and my brothers, my sisters were the people that mattered. Even the candy was simple at Christmas. What's the candy of Christmas? Candy canes, the lamest candy ever. I mean, I mean, you want to get a simpler candy than candy cane? I don't know what it is. You know what the ingredients of candy cane are? Peppermint. That's it. Or, or maybe it's just petrified toothpaste. I don't know what it is. We're going to give you, we're giving you candy canes when you come here because nobody else wants them. We can't give them to homeless people. They're like, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I haven't eaten in two days, but I'm not eating that. I mean, it's the candy of last resort. It's the candy of the apocalypse. It's the candy of the zombie invasion. I mean, Easter crushes Christmas simply because of chocolate. I mean, Halloween is wearing down on Christmas and that's got candy corn. You don't get much more simple than candy cane. Simply peppermint. I think that's the point of the Christmas story is that the chaos and losing track of what's really important because of our busyness is not what the story is about. So maybe, maybe today, maybe for the next 24 or 48 hours, we could be intentional about being present in one another's lives and the lives of the people who we love and the people we care about. Maybe. Maybe we, we could get that. We could give that. We could give that presence as the greatest present, the most valuable gift, our presence with one another. That's my hope for you this Christmas. It's my hope for my family this Christmas, that we might give the gift of being present with one another. I hope you get that. I get that. Merry Christmas.
song of fear 